Good morning, everyone. I am Pastor Dan from Rexmont EC Church here in Rexmont, Pennsylvania. I want to welcome you to our worship service this morning. Uh, Rexmont is located in the southern end of beautiful Lebanon County. If you can come and join us for a Sunday, we'd be more than happy to welcome you to our worship service. Today we are continuing our series, uh, Potluck series, where uh, members of the congregation can give me ideas for preaching. We're doing this throughout the summer, uh, kind of one-offs, because we know there's a lot of people going on vacations and things like that. So rather than preach a series where some people might miss out, we'll just do a, a bunch of potlucks. <laughs> Today's message is a message on one of the judges. I've had several people that have wanted me to do um, judges, and someone came to me uh, the other day and said, I would really like to hear a message on Ehud. And so I have titled this message, Ehud, Agent 007. <laughs> now, I'll warn you that this story in the Bible is definitely my kind of story. I taught junior high Bible for years, and this is one of the stories that the junior high kids really got into. There's a lot going on, a lot of junior high humor going on here. The story is found in Judges chapter 3, uh, verses 12 to 30. So if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, you can. Uh, back when stories were, uh, when this story would have happened, uh, obviously they, the average person could not read. And so these stories would have been passed on by people teaching their children or, or telling stories around the campfire at night. Or, and so that's what I kind of want to do today for the sermon. Um, just if you want, just sit back and enjoy imagine what's going on. I'll, I will put some verses up here on the screen for you if you want to look at them and follow along, but I'm not going to read the verses at this point. Uh, I'll just I'll just tell the story. And so the story begins as almost all stories do in, uh, in, in, in at least the stories in the judges. Now, once again, the Israelites have done evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so someone comes in and conquers them. God allows uh, them to be uh, the, taken over. And this time it's the, uh, Moabites, the Moabites with their king, Eglon. Now we do know a few things about King Eglon. One, we know that he was smart. He wanted to beat up the Israelites. He knew that they were God's people. He knew that they were still powerful, even though they disobeyed God. They were still powerful. They were not a weak little group of people. Um, and they they owned the world. It's probably the world's best land. Um, and they knew how to defend it. So he decided to get some help. And so he calls on some of his friends, the Ammonites, who really hated Israel, and the Amalekites, who really, really hated Israel, and gets them all to gang up against Israel. So he's he's a good military leader. He's got the smarts that he needs to put together a coalition. And uh, the Bible says he manages to hold power over Israel for 18 years. He's a smart man. We know he's rich. Um, he demands a tribute from the nation of Israel, and he's been collecting it for 18 years by the time of the story. And in, in certain translations like the NIV, you know, when it gets to verse 20 and it talks about uh, his dwelling place, there's a word that's used that we, translators aren't exactly sure what it means, but most of the time it's translated summer palace. So if he's got a summer palace, he probably has a winter palace, a spring palace, a uh, fall palace. I don't know how many palaces he had, but if the guy has more than one camp castle, he's, he's probably pretty well off. But there's also one thing, other thing that we know about him that's, that's really important to the story. In verse 17, uh, King Eglon is described as fat. And, and not just fat. But, I mean, very fat is what the Bible says. I'm talking Jabba the Hutt fat. Except, of course, he's a king. So, uh, 
<clears throat> that's he kind of kind of helps him out a little bit. Um, we pick up our story with the, the Israelites having serving their 18th year and getting ready to give their tribute to fat King Eglon. Now it says the people cried out to the Lord and for for help, and the Lord heard them, and he chose a man named Ehud. We know a little bit about him. Uh, he's a son of Gera. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. He's left-handed. We can also make a guess that he's probably uh, not that old uh, because the Bible says at the end of the story, uh, after he, after Ehud delivered the Israelites, there was peace in the land for about 80 years. And so if he was kind of helping to run things for 80 years, this is 80 years before that. And so he, he was probably in his late teens, early 20s when this story happens. Ehud is giving the job of taking King Eglon his tribute. And um, he makes a small uh, double-edged sword, um, about two feet in length. The Bible says one cubit, so it's about two feet in length. And, and hides it under his uh, clothes by strapping it to his right thigh. Uh, that's important because what usually happens with uh, other, with countries is when uh, another country comes in and takes over, and they they take away the ability of the common people to have weapons. I mean that's what most countries do when they invade and conquer a country. They remove the ability to make and have weapons. And Ehud manages to make one in secret. Um, with what I'm guessing is probably not the best tools around because they wouldn't have been allowed to have those. Ehud and, and a handful of other people, and because Ehud couldn't carry all the tribute gold himself, we'll talk about that in a couple minutes, um, they, Ehud and his, and his friends deliver the treasure and leave the palace. And then on the way home, Ehud then leaves the, his group and goes back to King Eglon's palace by himself. He walks in and he tells Eglon he has a secret for him. And King Eglon likes secrets, I guess. So he tells everyone in his uh, throne room area to leave him and Ehud alone. Ehud walks up to the king and says, I have a message from God for you. As King Eglon stands up, and I'm I'm guessing it was probably pretty hard for him since he's so fat. He kind of needs to use his arms and kind of work his way up. Uh, anyways, as as he works to, to stand up, um, Ehud takes the dagger strapped to his thigh and he plunges it into King Eglon's belly. And, 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 but you got to remember that Eglon is so fat that the Bible says the king's fat sucks the sword into his body, handle and all, and his belly fat kind of bloops over the handle, and, and you can't even see it anymore. It's just a right in there. That's actually the Hebrew word for it in the Bible. Okay? I think the King James translates it very well, but you know, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's in there somewhere. The belly flat envelops this two-foot sword. You can't even see it. But now, Ehud has a problem. He's trapped. He decides, because he's in the palace on the second, third, fourth floor. We don't know how high up the, the throne room was. And uh, he's just killed the king. And there's all kinds of soldiers and everything between him and freedom. So he decides to lock the door into the room and with, the, with him and, and the king. And, and then the Bible says he escapes. Now, again, there is a bit of a translation problem here because the, the Bible isn't exactly clear on how Ehud escapes. Um, and so there's basically two major theories that have come out of this story by biblical scholars as to how Ehud escapes. But one is that he just kind of like jumped off the porch of the upper room and, and down onto the ground. Um, but I don't know. I don't think he would be able to just run and jump off the second floor or third floor or even a fourth floor. You know, probably not. There's probably lots of people around 
watching. And I think if someone jumped out of an upper story window, someone would have noticed. So I'm, I'm guessing that's probably not what happened. The other translation uh, understanding kind of goes like this. And I got to give you a, a little history uh, about um, flushable toilets. There, there are basically three ways before before there were flushable toilets. There are basically three ways to get rid of um, bathroom waste. <laughs> One was to have an outhouse. Uh, you have to go outside and, and walk to another small building and to go to the bathroom. When I was in third grade, we were living in a place in Kenya that did not have running water to our house. And so we did have a, a long drop outhouse out back that we would go out to and use um, whenever we needed to to go. Eglon, uh, he's a fat boy. I doubt he's going to want to get up and go outside every time he needs a bathroom. Now, if he were somewhat rich, you could have a, a chamber pot that would be emptied for you by servants. But again, remember that Eglon is mm, uh, being a big, he's a big guy. He's going to need a a big chamber pot. Uh, plus he's the king and he doesn't really want a bowl of waste in his royal room where he is. And so that really leaves one other option. And what the, um, the what we call uber rich, the royalty would do, is they would have a bathroom on an outside wall. And we see this um, a lot in, uh, particularly in medieval castles, middle-aged castles, where uh, it became all the rage, but it was before that as well. And what would happen is one of the castle employees would have uh, the, the, the sad job of going outside and walking around the, the castle until he, he got to this little door underneath the bathroom and open it up and scoop out all the, the, the waste and uh, let in, in probably into the moat if there, if there was one and just kind of let the water take it away. Uh, but you didn't know you were going to see a, a picture of a guy sitting on the toilet when he came to church today, did you? <laughs> oh, well. So what many biblical scholars believe, and it's in uh, a couple of Bible translations, particularly the, the New Living Translation, is that Ehud escaped by going into the bathroom, opening that trap door, and climbing down through all that gunk and running away. <laughs> Yuck. Oh, that's nasty. I know, I know, I know. All scripture is God breathed. All scripture is God breathed, but that's just nasty. <laughs> all the people, including the guards, were asked to leave Ehud and Eglon alone. And and the way the story goes, the, the servants waited and waited for the king to come out. It, it says they waited because they thought he may be on the toilet. And they waited until uh, the point of embarrassment, until they got a key to unlock the doors and, that Ehud had locked and checked on the king. And by that time, the king was long dead and, and Ehud was long gone. So while the Moabites are all realizing their king is dead, uh, Ehud runs back, gets the Israelites rallied up, and tells them to attack, for the Lord has given the Moabites to them. And, and they do attack, and they win. They defeat the Moabites. And the Bible says the, the, the Israelites lived in peace for the next 80 years. Now, I know what you're thinking. Best story ever. <laughs> Especially for junior high kids. <laughs> But believe it or not, there's actually some things that we can learn from this story. Uh, first thing we can learn is that God hears you when you cry. Judges 3, 15a. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud. I wonder if for, for many people... We haven't gotten to the place where we pray because it's a habit. Not because we actually believe God will do anything. 
We have a number of people in our church that are, are going through medical issues right now. And how do we pray? Heal grandpa of this. Heal mom of that. Do we pray because we actually believe God will physically heal them? Or do we pray because it's the Christian thing to do? We need to start believing that God actually hears our requests and will do what we ask him to do. Uh, Mark chapter 11, verse 24, um, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. We need to start believing that God hears us. A lot of times we have a bit of a, a difficult attitude, different attitude. I heard a preacher once say that, you know, when things are, are kind of bad, we ask God for help. But when things are really bad, we, we blame God. And we, we run away. We need to start trusting God even when things go bad, I mean, really bad. If we ask him, God will come through. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 55 to 57. I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you and you said, do not fear. Jonah chapter 2, we talked about a number of a months ago. From inside the fish. Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realms of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. When things are going wrong, we need God's help. I don't think the issue is God doesn't hear us. What I think is we're not believing. Or maybe we're not even asking. Sometimes God waits for things to be right. The Israelites were enslaved by Moab for 18 years, but we don't know when they started to cry out. Um, did they start when, you know, at the beginning of the 18 years, or did they just start crying out 18 years into this? If they did start crying out right away and God knew Ehud was the person for the job, then God knew the people would have to wait. I mean, if Ehud was in his early 20s when he uh, had this incident with uh, King Eglon and 18 years before that he would have been what five six years old God hears our cries just because he doesn't answer when we want him to how we want him to or as big and as bold as we want him to doesn't doesn't mean he's not listening when God said, hey, here's Ehud, this guy is your rescuer. Do you think the Israelites were jumping up and down? No. Ehud is probably the least likely choice for someone to be a rescuer, a deliverer. But thankfully, God can use anyone. Ehud was not the typical idea of a rescuer. His name comes from the Hebrew root word for the that means sympathy or support. Would you want that kind of guy as your leader in a military victory? The guy whose name means sympathy? Kind of like today on Facebook, someone asks for help and all their friends say, oh, I'm sending you my thoughts and prayers. I'm putting a temporary frame around my Facebook profile picture that says, I'm praying for you. It doesn't do much good. And then we have this left-handed problem. For many people, this would have been a problem. In ancient thinking, the right was good. If you were an important person, you sat on the right hand side of the king. But the left was bad. In fact, our English word sinister comes from the Latin, which means from the left. We use that term now to be horrible and deviant from the left. Ehud was left-handed, but, but there's more than that going on. He was left-handed for a reason. The ancient Hebrew actually doesn't describe him as left-handed. It literally it says that he was right-hand restricted. That might mean that he didn't 
have the, the he didn't just not use his right hand it could also mean that Ehud's right hand was useless like he was deformed or, or crippled or or something so that he could not use his right hand and therefore became left-handed out of necessity it's also probably why uh, Ehud had to have some help delivering the tribute to King Eglon because he could only use one hand. But there's more about Ehud that doesn't give us much confidence. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, the weakest and smallest tribe in Israel. And even though there are some strong warriors that come from there, including uh, in a few years from now, King Saul, they were still looked upon as the little guys, the 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 weak tribe, the tribe from the youngest of Jacob's boys. This inability to use his right hand, the lack of military experience, probably played right into the plan that God had. Because he couldn't use his right hand instead of carrying the sword on the left side, as was normal, so you could pull it out with your right hand. Ehud placed the sword on his right side, so it would be easy to draw quickly when the time came. And he probably didn't even need to take that precaution. He seemed like such a non-threat to everyone that he was able to enter the king's presence with the sword not once, but twice. First when he brought the tribute, and again later on when he comes back with that message for the king. The guards are so confident in the lack of threat from Ehud that when the king tells them to leave, they go, okay, I'll go make myself a sandwich. And off they go for a while. What do you think the people of Israel thought? You cry out to God for a military leader to save you from the Moabites who have enslaved you. And God picks a, a young kid from the weakest tribe with a crippled right hand whose name means sympathy. Yay. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to win now. But... Those are the type of people that God uses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. But God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chooses the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. God uses regular people. God uses regular people like you. You don't feel good enough? Perfect. When God told Ehud his plan, do you think this guy who had been made fun of his whole life for being from a lesser tribe, for being left-handed, for possibly being a crippled, heard God's call and went, finally, it's about time I get to lead a military conquest. I'm pretty sure he had some questions himself. God doesn't ask us to wait until we feel ready or until someone out of the blue walks up to us and says we're ready. We're supposed to serve anyway. You know, the, the Apostle Paul, right? The, the guy that wrote all those books in the Bible. Fantastic person. You know what people said of him? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. In other words, people liked his writing, but he was kind of a wimp. And frankly, his preaching wasn't very good either. But he kept going because those are the people that God uses. God uses everyday people to do great things. That way we can know it's by God's power, not our own. But it's more than that, way more. It's one thing to say to God, you're willing to serve, but you, you have to be willing to do what God asks you to do. And like Ehud, a man who did some great things, he had to do some less fun things to get there. Sometimes... You have to go through the gunk. I want to say, though, just because you serve God doesn't mean you'll one day up, end up in actual sewage. But, but things will get messy. Sometimes in serving God, we have to do things that are hard or that we don't want to do. And too often, that's when 
people quit. But that's when we need to push on. Famous English author and Professor J.R.R. Tolkien wrote about this in his Lord of the Rings series. In volume two uh, of his series, uh, The Two Towers, um, more than midway through their quest to destroy the, the Ring of Power, Frodo and Sam have faced overwhelming odds of, of death and destruction. They've been, ta they've been tasked to, to carry Sauron's powerful master ring back to the fires of Mount Doom and destroy it to, to spare the world from the evil shadow that is bearing down. But the path they tread has caused a lot of despair and Frodo has about given up all hope. And he tells Sam, I can't carry on. And I love Sam's reply. He says, I know, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really matter, full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you. That meant something, even when you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in these stories had lots of chances of turning back. Only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. There's some good in the world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. What a powerful phrase. Even darkness must pass. Our example we're supposed to follow is, is Jesus. And look how things turned out for him. He left heaven and the ability to be God everywhere to, to become a person. For what? To be born poor, to never have a home, to rely only on the kindness of others, to sleep outdoors, to eventually die on a cross in a most horrific and brutal way. And here we are, 2,000 years later, trying to make following Jesus easy. Have your best life now. God wants you to be wealthy. Donate now and I'll send you my free book, Making Money God's Way. Since when was following Jesus supposed to be easy? Since when was serving supposed to be easy? When did we decide giving to God would be easy? Or we, could, or we would only tell other people about Jesus when we felt like it, when we felt it would be easy. Anything worth doing is, at some point, will be hard. And I think we all know that. We have to remember that goes for our Christian walk, too. If it's not hard for you, then maybe you aren't walking right. If it's not a struggle and you don't sometimes end up in the gunk, maybe you're not following the right Jesus. Luke 9, 23, Jesus had said, he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily. Follow me. The Apostle Paul, that, that weak preacher guy, <laughs> wrote, wrote in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. Crucifixion was hard. Our following Christ is meant to be the crucifixion, the killing of this old life and living a new life. And yes, one day it will be glorious and wonderful. We'll be rewarded in, in heaven, but not yet. We have to finish our jobs here on earth first. We need to be living for God, even when we're asked to follow him through the gunk and the grime. I want you to think about it. What can you do for God? Don't think about how he seems silent. Don't think about how you don't feel like doing 
the, doing it. Don't 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 think about how you're you don't think you're the right person. Don't think about how it might involve some work and even some things we might not want to do. What can you do? Not in your own power, but in God's power for you.